I'd like to read for you from a very familiar passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'd like to read verses 1 through 18, but we're going to uh, focus mainly upon verses 13 uh, through 18. So let me read this for you as we begin. <clears throat> Paul writes, uh, through the work of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instructions as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your own hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. By the way, we're going <clears> to <throat> we're going to focus on the comfort that comes from these words this morning. But we don't want to miss uh, what is in that final verse. And as we move this evening into chapter 5, and that is the idea that we should continually be doing what the Apostle Paul is doing here, which is encouraging and comforting and building us up so that we would be able to excel still more in the things that the Lord has called us to do. But let's focus this morning on the comfort that comes to us from this passage of Scripture. Now, the Scripture tells us, and actually we know from our own experience, when we lose lo our loved ones in the Lord Jesus, it grieves us because we love them. It grieves us because we miss them. At least it does for a time. Because they've been taken away from us, we can no longer enjoy their company and their fellowship and their love. We miss that, and it hurts. But thankfully, we don't grieve like those who have no hope, like those who really don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and who believe that death is the end and that they will never see their loved ones again. We don't grieve like that because in the gospel we have hope. The Lord has actually given to us a wonderful hope and a wonderful comfort. And that is that the, those that we love are not gone and they're not, they're not dead, but they are well as a matter of fact, the Bible says that they're better than well. They're actually more blessed than they have ever been in their lives, and they will be for all eternity. And we have the hope that we will see them again in the place where they are, a far better place, 
and we will get to enjoy their company and their fellowship forever. Now, we know that these things are true. We already know these things to be true. I, I don't think we're learning something this morning that we haven't heard before. But it's good at times like this to remind ourselves that they are true. We need to be encouraged again in these things. You know, it, it's one thing to know them and, you know, to know in our minds, to remember these things, that they're true. But it's another to hear them again and to be encouraged uh, in them again and to be among a people who all hold these things to be true and believe them together. There's just something very encouraging, very comforting about that. And that's what I want us really to, to do this morning, to remind ourselves that our loved one is well. Now, this morning, what I'd like to do is consider three reasons why we have this comfort and this hope in the Lord. Now, we have this hope, first of all, because our Lord tells us that when we leave this world, He takes us to be home. Now, you've probably already noticed this, but when the Bible speaks of death for the believer, it usually refers to it as a falling asleep in Jesus. It doesn't always say that, but usually says that. That's how Paul refers to it in our passage this morning. Notice in verses 13 and 14. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. You know, Luke uh, uses these same terms when he's talking about Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, verses 58 and 60, when the Jews stoned him to death simply because he told them about Jesus. I mean, he was loving them in a biblical way, telling them they needed to receive their Savior, whom they had crucified, whom they had rejected, and so forth. The Jews hated him, and they stoned him to death, and this is what we read. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. I do want you to notice a couple of things that, um, well, Stephen was not filled with malice and hatred and revenge. He didn't say, Lord, destroy them before what they're doing to me, but rather, do not hold this sin against them. And he also said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, not just keep me safe in the grave until the day you come again because I know that I'm going to be asleep in the grave, but receive my spirit. Let, bring me up into heaven. And then Luke says, having said this, he fell asleep. Now, the reason the scriptures speak in this way is because we as believers never really die. And those are the comforting words of our Lord Jesus Christ to Martha when she spoke to Jesus about her brother's death. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus says to her in John 11, verses 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, Jesus means that if the body dies, it will live again. But if you live and believe in Jesus, you'll never die because your soul goes to be with the Lord in heaven. Now, Jesus asks us the same question this morning. Do you believe this? Do you believe it's true? Well, if you do, it can give you a great deal of comfort and hope for yourself, but also for your loved ones that fall asleep in Jesus. When we fall asleep in Him, when those whom we love who are His fall asleep at that very moment, the Bible tells us, we simply move our residence from this world, from this habitation, from this temporary dwelling, this tent, to a permanent home in heaven. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 9, and again, this is tremendously encouraging, so just take it in. This is true. Paul writes this, For we know that if our earthly tent, which is our house and our body, is torn down, 
we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. Now again, notice what Paul is telling us here. As long as we are present in our bodies, as long as we are alive here in this world, we are absent from the Lord, from His blessed presence in heaven. doesn't mean that God isn't here, but it means that we are not where He reveals all of His love and grace and mercy in a way that we've never seen before. We are not with Him in heaven. But once we are absent from our bodies, when our bodies die, we go to be at home with the Lord. We go to heaven. Now, Paul tells us in this text that that is really what we prefer. He says, we are good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Clearly, this is what the Apostle Paul wanted in his own life. Consider what he says again in Philippians 1, verses 21 through 24. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, most of us, I think, usually go through life deathly afraid of death. We, we don't want to die. We want to hold on to our lives. We think somehow we're going to lose something that, that we can't afford to lose, that is too precious to lose. But I want you to notice that Paul says to die is gain. Now, he says, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose, but I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and to be with Christ for that is very much better. It's very much better than living in this world. Now again, do you believe that? Do you, do you believe that's true? And do you, do you experience that? Is that your desire to depart and to be with Him? Maybe it isn't at the level where it is with the Apostle Paul. I'm not sure how many of us can really answer to this. But I hope you can see that if you have this desire, what a great comfort it brings, and particularly when you realize that this is true, what a great comfort it brings for those you know who have died in the Lord Jesus who actually have what Paul is talking about here. Now, we cannot choose when we're going to go there. The timing is completely in the Lord's hands, but when it's His time, we will go. When it's His time, really nothing can stop that, and we shouldn't really desire anything to stop that. When it's His time, he will send His angels to bring us home. Apparently, our souls don't have the ability just to be transported to heaven or somehow to fly there on our own. We need the angels. That's what we read earlier in Luke 16, 22, where Jesus was telling us about the rich man and Lazarus. He says, now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. He was carried by the angels to heaven. You know, the Lord tells us He actually made these angels to minister to us throughout life. Are they not ministering spirits? The author to the Hebrews says, sent out to render service to those who will inherit salvation. Yes, that's what they are. They work with us. They protect us. They do many things. We don't actually get to see it because they are invisible, but we do know that they're there. But here is one other thing they do. At the end of our lives, they are there waiting for us and when our souls are separated from our bodies, they immediately take hold of them and they take us into heaven. When it's His time, they bring us from this world into the next. Now again, this is our first point. Now we have hope because when we or our loved ones in Christ fall asleep, 
Jesus brings us home by his angels. We fall asleep here, and we wake up in heaven. Apparently, the trip could be relatively quick. I don't know. I have heard uh, various expositions where you get to see the cosmos as you're traveling from one place to the other. We don't really know what happens in between. But we do know that when we fall asleep in Christ, we wake up in heaven and we see the Lord. That's why Paul writes in verse 14 of our text, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. The reason why he's bringing them with him is because they have been with him from the time that they've died to the time he actually returns. Now, secondly, we have hope because our Lord tells us that this home that he's taking us to is actually a very wonderful place. One thing that makes any place a pleasant place to be is the company that's, that's found there. That's one of the reasons why we enjoy getting together on Sundays and meet together as God's people because we enjoy the, the company that is here, the company of the saints. When there are people here that welcome you because they, they love you, I mean, that, that's just a, a wonderful thing to experience and we all enjoy it. Well, that's exactly what heaven is like, but it's, it's much better than that. Because there, as we've already mentioned, the Father is, is there. Now, again, God is everywhere. We know that. But he is there in a very particular way expressing his love and his mercy. And remember who the Father is. The Father is the one who loves us and who actually has loved us from all eternity. We know that if we're trusting in Jesus, he's the one who sent his Son for us which is what the table again reminds us of this morning, so that, as we saw last week, we might eventually come to heaven and be with him for the rest of eternity, for the rest of time. And when we get there, the Father will welcome us. The Son is also there who also loved us, who was willing to come down from heaven and into the sinful world to live for us and to die for us. He's there He's waiting to welcome us as well. The Spirit is there who loves us and who by the grace of Christ has come into our hearts and given us the ability to trust in Jesus and be saved, who has been preparing us from that time as we were reminded by Sinclair Ferguson. Remember, he's the homemaker. Jesus went to heaven to prepare a home for us. He sent the Spirit of God into the world to prepare us for heaven, but also to make a home in us so that the Lord might dwell in us. So he loves us and he's been working with us and he's been preparing us to enter into this eternal home and when we arrive there, he will welcome us. Now, we know something of what this is like. We've already read a little bit in Scripture about this pledge of the Spirit of God, this down payment, this engagement ring, as it were. It's like a piece of the inheritance that we get ahead of time and that little bit of heaven that we experience by the Spirit's presence in our hearts is really meant to show us what heaven is like. And when we arrive there, we get the whole inheritance. We get all that love. Uh, Ezekiel Hopkins writes this regarding heaven. He says, heaven is where the unveiled glories of the deity shall beat full upon us and we forever sun ourselves in the smiles of God. I mean, here, the Lord is somewhat restrained in his love toward us. We don't experience the full amount, but there it is unrestrained. And we get to see him in all his glory. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit are there. They love us. They're ready to welcome us. But there's others there, other company who will also welcome us. The holy angels who have loved us and watched over us and who brought us to heaven will be there to welcome us. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that whenever a sinner repents whenever one of Christ's sheep come into the fold, there is rejoicing in heaven among the angels. You know, the angels love you, and they're rooting for you, and they're waiting to welcome you, and they will when you arrive in heaven. Those who have gone before us are now perfect in the Lord Jesus, and they are also there waiting to welcome us. The author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 12, verses 22 through 24, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, 
and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous, made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. He's describing for us what heaven is like, and that's what we get to see when we finally leave this world and go to be with him. And this is what those whom we love already see. And of course, when we see them, we're reminded by Thomas Watson that even saints that we have never seen in our lives before, we will know them, we will recognize them. Uh, Thomas Watson writes this, and I think this is true. This is sort of extrapolating from Scripture because Scripture doesn't seem to be terribly specific about this, but this is how he reasons. He says, some have asked whether we shall know one another in heaven. Surely our knowledge will not be diminished, but increased. The judgment of Luther and Anselm and many other divines is that we shall know one another. Yes, the saints of all ages, whose faces we never saw. And when we shall see the saints in glory, without their infirmities of pride and passion, it will be a glorious sight. That is what is waiting for us in heaven and what our brother is experiencing in heaven. Now, something else, of course, that makes a place pleasant to be is the environment, you know, and, and maybe, you know, this church building isn't the most pleasant environment to be in, but heaven certainly is. Heaven is perfect in every way. In heaven, all of our needs are met. There's no more pain, no more suffering, and death certainly is abolished once and forever. There's no reason ever to be sad, no reason to grieve, nothing but pure happiness and joy. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 25, verse 8, He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces, and He will remove the reproach of His people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. As a matter of fact, all the things that we have to go through on earth which are not pleasant, and none of us are here deceived into thinking that life is just one continual blessing as far as the things we have to endure. There are many trials and hardships and even the grieving that we have to go through with the loved ones that we've missed. But the thing is, we go through all of these things and the fact that we go through all these things are not only working for our good here, but they'll also make heaven that much more pleasant when they are all removed and we don't have to deal with them any longer. Thomas Adams writes this and I'll try to read it in a way that it makes it understandable, but listen to what he says. He says, he that will be knighted must kneel for it, and he that will enter in at the straight gate must crowd for it, a gate made so on purpose, narrow and hard in the entrance, yet after we have entered, wide and glorious, that after our pain, our joy may be the sweeter. I hope you understand what he was saying there. It's hard on this side. It's hard to enter into the kingdom. There's a lot of difficulties and trials that we have to face. But that makes heaven so much more glorious. After our pain, our joy will be all the sweeter. Now, the fact, th this is something I think is very encouraging. And you've heard me read this before, but I thought it would be encouraging again. When we consider what it costs the Father in order to give us heaven, which was the life of His dear Son. That tells us that the happiness that we'll experience there must be consistent, must be equal to the price that was paid. And if that's true, then considering the price, which is the precious life of the Lord Jesus who is infinite in value, heaven must be beyond anything that we can imagine. Jonathan Edwards writes this, If nothing be too much to be given to man and to be done for man in the means of procuring his happiness, which is heaven, nothing will be too much to be given to him as the end. No degree of happiness is too great for him to enjoy. When I think how great this happiness is, Sometimes it is ready to seem almost incredible, unbelievable. But the death and sufferings of Christ make everything credible, believable, that belongs to this blessedness. For if God would so contrive to show his love 
in the manner and means of procuring our happiness. Nothing can be incredible in the degree of happiness itself. If all that God does about it be of a peace, he will also set infinite wisdom on work to make their happiness and glory great in the degree of it. If God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Nothing could have been such a confirmation of their blessedness as this. Why is heaven so great and glorious? Because of the price that was paid. If the Lord would not spare his own son, but give him up for us, how will he not with him give us all things, the kingdom forever? And so we have hope, first of all, for ourselves and for our loved ones, because the Lord tells us that when we fall asleep, he takes us to be with him in heaven. And we have hope, secondly, because our Lord tells us that the home he's taking us to is a wonderful place, full of those who love us and are waiting there to welcome us. And then we have hope finally, and we don't grieve as others because we will see our loved ones again. Of course, that goes along with the perfect saints, those who are perfected in heaven. And we will see them as we've never seen them before, alive and well and happier than they have ever been. And we will be like them because we're all going to be like Jesus and we will join them in that place where we're going to be able to love and enjoy each other forever. Now, let's not forget, when we get there, we're going to see Jesus, and he's going to overshadow everything, and we're going to see God as he reveals himself and all his blessedness. We're going to see a lot of things, okay? So it's not that we're just going to be focusing on them, but we will see those whom we love, and we will see them enjoying those things as well they will be so blessed. Now, if the Lord should come before we fall asleep in the Lord Jesus, he says, Paul tells us, that he is going to bring our loved ones with him, that is, if we live, to the coming of the Lord. And again, let me just read our passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let me just point out to you what may have occurred to you as I've read this. Some people read this and they believe that uh, the reason why Jesus brings those who have fallen asleep with him is because he raised them first, and they first met him, and after they're with him, and then we come up to meet meet them as they're basically coming down, that that's why they're with him. But we've just seen several passages that tell us that isn't the case. Their bodies will be raised, and they will be reunited with their souls that are coming down with Jesus because their souls have been with him all during that time. So if we live to the coming of the Lord, then we will see them as they're coming down and we're coming up to meet them. But if, on the other hand, we should fall asleep before the Lord comes, that's when we will see them. And let's not forget, that will not be very long for any one of us here because life is short and we will all soon be with him. If we've trusted Jesus, James writes in James 4, verse 14, you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Those of you who are as old as I am or older, or maybe not quite as old, realize that life goes very, very quickly. It seems when you're younger, it's, it's a long time, but it seems like the older you get, the shorter it seems. Life is short. And even if we should live to be 100 years old, that's just a vapor, just a breath that appears for a little while. Isaac Watts reminds us in his famous hymn, 
Our God, Our Help in Ages Past, which is based upon Psalm 90, where Moses expresses the same thing. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream, dies at the opening day. Life is very short, so we will soon see them again. But let me just again encourage you in these things that that is not the end. It's only the beginning for everyone who trusts in the Lord. Our friend, our brother, husband, and father, Joseph Barlow, has fallen asleep in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do not grieve as those who have no hope because the angels have taken him up into heaven. He is there right now enjoying the perfect peace, joy, and happiness of heaven and fellowship with a company of, of beings that love him, love him more than, than really anyone can love him on earth. He's in the presence of his God. He's in the presence of his Savior. He's in the presence of the angels and of the saints. And we will see him again when we join him in just a little while because of what Jesus has done. So I hope that these words bring comfort, bring hope. That's what the Lord intends them to be. That's why he's given us the gospel so that we would not grieve as those who have no hope, but rather that we would live in the full light of the hope that he gives to us in the gospel. So let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us by faith to receive this hope and this encouragement and also, let's, uh, as we do, uh, prepare to come to the table and to remember why it is we have this hope. It's because God was willing to give his son. The son was willing to come and give his life. Jesus died and he rose again to overcome death so that we might also live with him forever.